resting heart rate and heart rate variability. How are they impacted by physical activity, body weight, and diet? So first, let's define a few terms. So the resting heart rate, or RHR, is the heart rate in beats per minute BPM while at rest. And the heart rate variability, HRV, is the variability for the time in between heartbeats. So if your heart rate is 60 beats per minute, the assumption is that it beats once every second, but there's variability in how often the heart beats. It may beat once every 0.9 seconds, every one second, 1.1 seconds, etc. So that variability is the heart rate variability. All right, so how does the resting heart rate change during aging? So this is a study of 90,000 plus people. We've got average resting heart rate on the y-axis plotted against age from 20 to 85 years. And what we can see is that for both women in green and men in blue, the resting heart rate increases up until about 50 years, after which it then decreases all the way up to 85. What about HRV? How does that change during aging? So this is from a much larger study of 8.2 million plus subjects. And here we're looking at the RMSSD, that's the root mean squared of successive differences. Uh, that's one metric for measuring heart rate variability plotted against age. And in this case, it's going from 20 to 60 years. And what we can see is when uh, delineating the line for men in blue, but the data for women is similar, uh, we can see that heart rate variability is somewhere in the 70s uh, in it for a 20 year old, and then it declines to about half that in 60 year olds for both men and women. And note that's for heart rate variability measured in the morning at six in the morning. For people that measured uh, at six o'clock at night, we can see a similar trend in the dashed blue and uh, red lines. So uh, in advanced age for bo on both of these graphs, we can see that uh, that's characterized by relatively low resting heart rate and also a low heart rate variability. In contrast, youth is characterized by relatively low resting heart rate, at least when compared with 50 year olds, but also a high heart rate variability. So with the goal of being chronologically old, but biologically young, which factors can impact resting heart rate and heart rate variability? And as mentioned in the opening, today, uh, today I'm going to go through data for physical activity, body weight, and diet. So uh, in terms of a measure of daily physical activity, the fitness tracker that I use uh, uh, also gives me data not just for resting heart rate and heart rate variability, but the average daily heart rate, so the heart rate for the whole day, not just at rest uh, while I'm sleeping in the morning. So uh, is the average daily heart rate significantly correlated with resting heart rate or heart rate variability? And that's what we can see here. So the resting heart rate on the y-axis plotted against my average daily heart rate uh, for each day on the x. And what we can see is that the more active that I am on each day, that's significantly correlated with a higher next day resting heart rate, significantly correlated. Uh, conversely, uh, the more active that I am is indicated by the average daily heart rate. We can see that heart rate variability is significantly lower. Now, this raises the interesting uh, idea you know, about the optimal physical activity dose that can minimize next day variations in heart rate variability and resting heart rate while also maximizing fitness. And that's beyond the scope of this video. Uh, I'll probably address that in a future video. Actually, I'll investigate it in my data first and then present it in a future video. All right, so what about body weight? Is that correlated with heart rate variability and resting heart rate? So that data is here. And I should mention that the data for physical activity, I only had the idea to measure or to start tracking, recording and tracking my average daily heart rate in March of 2020. Although my fitness tracker has provided that since I started tracking in uh, August of 2018, I didn't have the idea to record that. I didn't see the usefulness of it uh, until unfortunately uh, March of last year. But I've been tracking and recording my resting heart rate and heart rate variability since August of 2018. So I have almost 1200 days of data that correspond to my body weight, my morning body weight, which I've been measuring every day in the morning since uh, 2015. So again, I've got about 1200 days of data for correlate, uh, correlations between resting heart rate on the y-axis against body weight on the x. And what we can see is that the higher my body weight, that's co significantly correlated with a higher resting heart rate. And remember, youth is characterized by relatively lower resting heart rates, but also higher heart rate variability. Uh, conversely, we can see now that my, the higher my, uh, at my body weight, the lower my heart rate variability, significantly lower as shown there by the p-value and the uh, correlation coefficient, uh, little r. So this also raises a question, you know, what body weight optimizes both resting heart rate and heart rate variability? And as we can see for both data, somewhere around 151 pounds results or is correlated with my lowest resting heart rate, but also my highest heart rate variability. So I'm currently around 155 and slowly working towards getting back towards 150, 151, and even uh, you know, lower if I can, I can uh, get there and sustain it. Now note that for a given average daily heart rate, having a higher body weight on that day would result in a more daily exertional strain. In other words, if my average daily heart rate is 60 beats per minute and I weigh 150 pounds, 
versus weighing 160 pounds, because I'm carrying 10 pounds more weight, that's an overall greater daily exertion or daily strain when, uh, when compared with only using the average daily heart rate. So we can combine both, both those metrics, body weight and the average daily heart rate, into a daily strain or a daily exertion metric by multiplying them both and then comparing them against resting heart rate and heart rate variability. So that's what's shown here. So we, on the y-axis, we've got resting heart rate plotted against this metric of daily exertion or daily strain. And we can see that the higher my daily strain, that's significantly correlated with a higher next day resting heart rate, again, going in the wrong direction. And also going in the wrong direction with a higher daily exertion or a higher daily strain is my heart rate variability, variability where we can also see significantly lower HRV for a higher daily uh, strain or daily exertion. So um, let's put that data aside for now. We'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, I'm going to show some data where we adjust our models for uh, this exertion metric, and, but also uh, with some dietary variables. So shifting over to diet, how does diet correlate with resting heart rate and heart rate variability? So the first obvious measure or, or metric for uh, diet would be calorie intake. And that's what's plotted here. So we've got uh, resting heart rate on the y-axis plotted against my daily calorie intake. And for those who don't know, I've been weighing all my food since 2015 and then tracking it and logging it into uh, an Excel file. So I have lots of dietary data uh, over the past three plus years that I've been tracking my uh, fitness metrics, as we can see by almost 1,200 days of data. So now we can see the strongest data of all the data I presented so far. The higher my calorie intake, that's significantly correlated with, correlated with a higher resting heart rate. And also conversely, a higher calorie intake is significantly correlated with a lower heart rate variability. So uh, when considering all the data I just presented, this suggests that physical activity, body weight, and calorie intake can be specifically titrated to optimize both resting heart rate and heart rate variability. And I'll go more into depth in future videos uh, to actually see what may be optimal for me. Now, more specifically in terms of diet, what about diet composition? Just calorie intake says nothing about whether it's higher fat, higher carbs, higher fiber, et cetera. So what about correlations and associations for diet composition with these metrics? Uh, so first I'm gonna present the data for heart rate variability with dietary macronutrients because the strongest associations uh, were present for that with lesser but still significant associations for resting heart rate, which I'll show next. Now note that in previous videos, although I've shown unadjusted correlations between diet with blood-based biomarkers, uh, in this case, when considering that we know that physical activity, body weight, and also calorie intake are significantly associated with resting heart rate and heart rate variability, variability they should be in any model that looks at potential associations uh, or significant associations for macronutrients with these, with these metrics. So in this case, I uh, created linear regression models that were adjusted for, or that included daily exertion, so that body weight times average daily heart rate, and also calorie intake, and then also uh, each individual macronutrient. So there are eight different models. Each of them have these daily exertion and calorie intake uh, uh, variables, but then each of the respective macronutrients. And note that um, daily exertion and calorie intake on their own, when uh, uh, associated with heart rate variability, account for a small but significant amount of the variance in HRV, so 5.7%. Now, that may not seem like much, especially when we look at how that relates to uh, resting heart rate. We'll see that daily exertion and calorie intake actually explain more of the variance in resting heart rate, but it's 6%, you know, and that's, that it, the data is what it is. All right, so what's the data for macronutrients and how they relate to heart rate variability after adjusting for daily exertion and calorie intake? That's what's shown here. Uh, the N, starting on the left, is uh, five, it's 593 days of data. So let's, there's a lot to unpack here. Let's just walk through it step by step. So in terms of macronutrients, I looked at uh, carbohydrates uh, and I split carbohydrates into two different fractions, non-fructose carb carbohydrates and fructose. So I've been tracking both of those uh, you know, since 2015, so I have data for that. Uh, each of the fatty acids, so monounsaturated, MUFA, omega-3, omega-6, saturated fatty acids, SFA, and then also protein and fiber intake. And then we've got the beta coefficient, plus or minus a standard error. So that's, you know, are these macronutrients associated with higher or lower HRV? The p-value for whether those associations are statistically significant. The significance f, so whether or, uh, or not, in this case, they are, whether each of these uh, linear regression models, the eight different models for the eight different macronutrients after adjusting for exertion and calorie intake are significantly associated with HRV. And as we can see, they're all less than 0.05, so they're all statistically significant. The adjusted R squared, how much of the variance is explained in total by the three variables, 
um, the percent explained relative to the base model, so how much additional variance in HRV is explained by the addition of each of the respective macronutrients, and then average daily intake, which we can use, which we can use to guide how much or how little of these foods may be uh, able to optimize heart rate variability, and in the next slide, uh, resting heart rate. So what's significantly associated with higher HRV? And in this case, we can see monounsaturated fatty acids, omega-6, and protein intake. Now, how much uh, additional variance in HRV do they explain? Now, it may not seem like much as protein, for example, uh, seems to contribute or contributes the most uh, explanatory, um, um, uh, you know, 2.5%. Uh, in addition, it explains an additional 2.5% in addition to the 5.7% that daily exertion and calorie intake explain in HRV. And then relatively smaller amounts is explained by the addition of, uh, by the association for omega-6 and monounsaturated fatty acids. All right, so then in terms of nutrients that were associated with lower HRV, uh, fructose, higher fructose, lower HRV, uh, saturated fatty acids, higher saturated fatty acids, lower HRV, and then also higher fiber, lower HRV. And in terms of how much additional uh, um, a percentage of the variance in HRV that they explain, the strongest negative, uh, you know, strongest contributor was fiber, uh, uh, explaining an additional 2.1%, bringing the total for that model up to 7.8%. And then with lesser amounts for saturated fatty acids, 1.1%, and fructose, so 0.8%. And also note that although non-fructose carbohydrates were very close to statistical significance, 0.06, it's technically not st statistically significant. And then omega-3 intake is not statistically uh, significantly associated with HRV. So that, that summarizes the data that I just presented, with, which then raises the interesting question, can diet be personalized? Can, can this diet be personalized to optimize next day heart rate variability after a workout? So when considering my average daily intake data, uh, assuming for a typical amount of calories on a workout day, uh, and looking at my average daily intake for each of these blue and, uh, sorry, green and red macronutrients, this suggests that eating more than 20 grams per day of monounsaturated fatty acids, more than 11 grams per day of omega-6, more than 120 grams of protein, but then correspondingly less than 79 grams per day for fructose, uh, less than 38 grams per day for saturated fatty acids, and less than 91 grams per day for fiber may optimize my next day HRV. And I intend on uh, you know, following this path and then reevaluating my data at a future point to see if it actually uh, is still strongly or significantly correlated with HRV. All right, so what about the data for resting heart rate? And as you can see by the title, there are weaker but statistically significant associations for these dietary components with resting heart rate. So note that whereas the combination of daily exertion and calorie intake accounted for 5.7 of the variance explained in heart rate variability, which is relatively small, now those two variables explain a much larger amount of the variance in resting heart rate, 44.4%. All right, so what's significantly associated with uh, lower resting heart rate, so going in the right direction. And again, we can see uh, higher monounsaturated fatty acids and higher omega-6 uh, is correlated, uh, associated after adjusting for daily exertion and calorie intake are associated with lower HRV, and they were also associated with high, uh, sorry, lower resting heart rate, and they were also associated with higher HRV. And then in terms of the percentage uh, that is explained by these um, macronutrients relative to the base model, note that these are relatively smaller effects with the exception of monounsaturated fatty acids as, as it explains an additional 1.3% of the variance in resting heart rate, but then relatively smaller effects for omega-6, 0.3%, you know, compared to the, to the uh, macronutrient associations for heart rate variability, these are relatively smaller um, uh, explanations, additional explanations in resting, resting heart rate. All right, so in terms of the nutrients that are associated with higher resting heart rates, so uh, carbohydrate intake, whether non-fructose or fructose, and then also higher fiber is associated with rest, uh, higher resting heart rate. And in terms of how much they explain, the, the additional uh, uh, amount of var the variance explained in resting heart rate, again, we can see relatively small amounts, 0.4% uh, for uh, either of the two carbohydrate divisions, and only 0.2% uh, additional explained for fiber. Now, uh, also note that omega-3, saturated fatty acids, and protein were not significantly associated with resting heart rate. Now, this, this diet, you know, having relatively higher levels of MUFA and omega-6, but lower carbohydrate and, potential, and, and fiber intake, this would suggest that I could potentially increase my heart rate variability and resting heart rate to a much lesser degree. Uh, but it, will optimizing or getting as much bang for my buck through diet and its impact on uh, cardiovascular related metrics, is that good for the, my overall systemic health in terms of uh, big picture biomarkers that I presented in other videos? In other words, do I optimize CV metrics, but then make 
the net effect uh, worse on my overall health. So I haven't investigated that. Once I do that analysis, I'll present that data in another video. Uh, uh, so stay tuned for that data. All right, if you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, including daily data for resting heart rate and heart rate variability, and my daily dietary data, come check us out on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.